Now, as we seem to be having um, technical difficulties with the Zoom meeting, I'm running the Zoom meeting and just going to record it. Um, so to, for the uh, French macaron, the ingredients that we're using are fresh egg whites. And so the question often then comes up if you using fresh egg whites for these types of things, what do you do with all the leftover egg whites? Um, I usually make custard with them, either creme brulee, creme caramel, vanilla sauce, or things of that nature. Um, or you can enrich your sponge cakes. If you make sponge cakes with whole eggs, you can add a couple of egg yolks to it to make them a little bit richer as well. Um, there's another option. I'm going to close the blinds here. That's one advantage to doing it in the evening is the lighting's a little better, <laughs> at least in this kitchen anyway, something to keep in mind for the future. Um, so we have egg, uh, egg whites and um, in this particular recipe, so egg whites are best for this type of thing, uh, for whipping meringues to be at room temperature. Um, uh, they, they whip much better, you get better volume and better firmness uh, in terms of holding the structure. Um, in my apprenticeship, we actually used to let the egg whites dry out a little bit by putting them in a, in a wide bowl uh, with a, a cloth over it so nothing could fall in, but that it could breathe to allow them to evaporate um, so that they would uh, become more concentrated. It's a little bit risky, um, even though they do get baked and you know, internal temperature will kill all the bacteria. Um, but so today the easier method of getting these stronger egg whites is to add egg white powder. So it's just a small amount, there's only four grams, which amounts to uh, about uh, half a tablespoon roughly um, in of egg white powder. Um, you can do it without, um, just whip them, you know, make sure that they are, are whipped nice and stiff. What helps sometimes with the, to evaporate them, the egg whites a little bit, is to freeze them um, because they will lose some moisture in the freeze thaw process. So if you freeze your egg whites, uh, especially if you do a lot of things with egg yolks and you have extra egg whites, well now you have a reason to freeze them and use them for macaron or other types of meringue things. Um, and uh, so the other ingredients we have then for is egg whites and granulated sugar with the egg white powder, which is what we're going to whip. And then we have uh, powdered sugar. Um, in Canada, it's uh, sold and called icing sugar. Uh, in the UK, it's usually uh, often referred to as confectioner's sugar. Uh, in the US, we call it powdered sugar. Um, and then we have super fine ground almonds. Um, if you don't have the super fine ground almonds, they're, they, they're getting easier to find these days with all the interest in gluten-free baking. Um, it was next to impossible to find before. It was all you could find was almond meal most of the time. Um, and, um, and then we have, we're making chocolate macaron today, so I also have cocoa powder. I just have what I have available here, retail, uh, which is a Fry's uh, natural cocoa powder. Um, so it is not uh, a very, it, uh, it's slightly Dutch, so it is, sorry, it's, um, it's lightly alkalized. Um, if you can get a more alkalized cocoa powder and higher fat content, which is a deep reddish brown, the color of the macaron look nicer. They look, they'll look more chocolatey. Right? And so if you have a food processor, the best thing is to take these three, the powdered sugar, the almonds, and the cocoa powder. And if you're not making them chocolate, you just leave the cocoa powder out. Um, and you process them in a food processor. I forgot one step, okay? One step I, I often forget. The almonds contain a lot of moisture. And so when you process them, they might gum up in the processor. Some of that could also be oil, but it's, a lot of it's also, the almonds are quite moist. Um, so you wanna take, uh, this recipe calls for 110 grams of uh, almond flour. And so you'd want to take about 125 grams and put it in the oven at 200 uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then I let it cool completely. Um, and that will dry them out and evaporate, drive off a whole bunch of the moisture, making it easier to process. So the reason we weigh 125 to put it in the oven is that you're probably going to lose somewhere between 10 to 15 grams of moisture um, from the drying process. Um, and so, um, 
So before I start, um, because the mixer makes a lot of noise and I'm going to edit that out in the video that I post to YouTube, I'm going to prepare the ingredients. So the other thing also just to, to mention in terms of uh, preparation is you want to have a, a sheet, a baking sheet uh, prepared, either with a silicone mat, which is my preference, um, because it releases so easily, um, it bakes a little slower from the bottom. Some people prefer parchment paper because there's less insulation and they, they bake a little bit quicker that way. Um, that's usually if you bake at lower temperatures, like 300 degrees, I bake at 325. Um, or you can also, what also works is to grease and flour it. Um, you want to use grease and flour because the flour is what helps prevent them from spreading. Um, uh, and um, <clears throat> so that's another uh, preparation tip there. Okay, so I don't have a food processor. So I'm going to uh, blend the ingredients in a bowl first. And so I'm going to take the powdered sugar and the ground, the almond flour and the cocoa powder. And so maybe just to quickly review those, the cocoa powder I'm using is just fries off of the store shelf. Um, premium Dutch cocoa powder, uh, so it's only lightly Dutch. Dutching is the alkalization process. The more it's alkalized, the darker it gets. Oreo cookies are, for example, made with a highly alkalized cocoa powder that looks black. Um, and for egg whites, I have egg white powder that I just purchased off of uh, Amazon, off the internet. Um, and uh, this tends to be difficult to find retail unless you're in a large city um, where there might be more demand for it. Again, with the interest in gluten-free and high protein foods and things like that, these types of things like egg white powder are becoming a little more commonplace to find. Um, and an example being the almond flour is actually it even says perfect for gluten-free baking. Um, and this is great value almond flour. So meaning this is Walmart. Um, and so uh, Walmart has this in their gluten-free section and this is a one kilo bag and it's, it's uh, for the um, considering it's almonds it was relatively reasonable it was actually on sale when we bought it so that's why I bought the whole kilo and I like to use almond flour in a lot of different pastries uh, and things um, to add richness or as part of just the type of recipe um, so I just want to mention that and my powdered sugar is just your standard uh, Red path icing sugar, as you see, we're in Canada, so it's called icing sugar, um, sucre à glace. Um, and um, in, in the States, it would be powdered sugar, and in the UK, I've uh, usually found it as confectioner's sugar. Okay, so I've got these in the bowl, and I'm just going to use a whisk, and I'm just blending them up with the whisk to uh, get them all blended together. And you'll be able to see that. Um, as it blends together, it's all disappearing, but you can see there's quite a few lumps. There's the white sugar lumps and there's the, the brown cocoa powder lumps. And so we want to eliminate those. Um, and the processing would help eliminate that. Plus it all, the processing would help ensure that the, the almond flour is super fine. The finer the almond flour, the smoother the tops of your meringues will be. Um, and so if you, you know, if it's just for home enjoyment, they will taste just as wonderful. Um, but as far as appearance, when you want that perfect, perfectly smooth appearance, it needs to be a super fine almond flour. Um, and so to get those lumps out, we are going to uh, put it through a sieve. And so just use a fine sieve and take a little at a time and sift it through there. Um, so we just shake it to get the bulk through and then use, I use the plastic scraper or a rubber spatula to um, help press the lumps through the screen of the sieve. Don't have to apply a lot of pressure, it's just moving it back and forth. So this scraper has a little round edge to it, so it fits nicely for this type of application. Um, 
I'm trying to mostly just get all of those sugar and cocoa lumps through to break those up. And there will be a little bit of granular almond left behind. And I will just add it back in because it's, it's not a uh, foreign material or anything. We're just trying to get as much of it fine and well blended as possible. Most of the time today in recipes where it, it asks you to sift the ingredients, it's either about breaking up compression lumps, which is what these lumps are with the, the powdered sugar and the cocoa powder is, is that they're so fine that with their own weight sitting in the cupboard, it compresses it together and, and becomes little, uh, these little lumps. Um, and um, the other reason we, we sieve is in a lot of, especially like in cake mixes or things like that, is because you're blending the flour with perhaps a starch, if there's a starch in the recipe, and the leavening agents like uh, baking powder, uh, bake and baking soda. And so to ensure a good blend, um, sifting is employed. And um, some recipes, some of the European uh, pastry cake recipes for home will usually tell you to sift at least twice. Um, and the reason for that is not because of foreign material, um, it's because of ge uh, getting a good blend. Right? Um, for sponge cakes made with uh, whipped eggs, it is useful to uh, also sift more than once to aerate the flour so that it um, is nice and light and easy to fold in. So there's just a little bit of round almonds, just a tiny bit. So I'm just going to add those in and, and blend that in. But the, you can see the majority of it all is, is nice, a nice fine powder now. Okay, so now for the, the noisemaker. My whisk has meringue on it because I, I prepped a, a batch to show you so that you won't have to wait a half hour for them to dry before I put them in the oven. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm gonna start with all the noise and putting the egg whites in. And I put a pinch of salt in. And that is to, the salt has a reaction with the protein and the egg whites. And um, the term that's used is that it, it charges the, the protein. So that if you imagine uh, protein is like, a, is like a coil. And so what this does, it helps that coil tighten up a little bit more and hold structure better. Um, so that in other words, it, it helps it whip better. And so we're gonna, going to uh, whip this on high until I get a good foam. And while that's whipping, I'm going to dry blend the egg whites and the sugar. What we're looking for before we add the sugar and the powdered uh, egg whites in is a nice beer foam, right? So like if it was a nice stiff head of foam on a beer, that's what we're looking for. And now we're going to add the granulated sugar and the egg white powder in thirds. So roughly one third at a time. And we're gonna beat them, beat it to stiff peaks. So we wanna whip the meringue to nice stiff peaks. So you see when you bring it up, the peak holds its shape. It won't drop out of the bowl. It doesn't change its shape at all. Now we're ready to make the macaron mixture, which the French refer to as a macaronage. This sounds kind of cool, macaronage. So I'm gonna start off with about one third of the dry and get that started first. So put that in and start folding it in.
Hope you can see that okay. Now, we'll, so you can see it's just blended together just until the, the powdered ingredients kind of disappear. And now I'll add the remaining ingredients and continue folding them all mixed in. Now with the cocoa powder version, the chocolate version, it's important not to overmix it because the fat in the cocoa powder will cause the meringue to collapse. But what you want to get it to is so that it has a slight, very slight flow to it. Okay, trying to get the lighting just right so that there's just a little bit of flow. Um, I've seen where they say you can draw a figure eight with it. Uh, but it shouldn't be running. You see, you see it has some droop, but it holds its shape. That's, that's the important thing. And now we're going to put it in a piping bag to dress it onto our baking pan. So I have these um, small piping bags that are not tiny, not a decorating bag, but uh, like a ice, uh, wedding cake decorating bag, but little bit smaller than the, some of the big baker's bags. Um, just handy this way. Uh, you don't want to overfill anyhow. Um, I have fairly large hands, so it makes it a little bit easier for me to squeeze. Um, but if you have a big bag and you fill it too full, it just takes too much muscle power and you become tired too quickly. And so cut the end off, put the piping tube in. And I am using um, an 808. Um, according to the Atiko size, so uh, usually like a baker's number eight. And we're going to make these roughly one inch in diameter, so you're piping them about the size of a quarter. Um, you can actually buy um, silicone mats that have the circles on it for you already, for, for macaron and for cream puffs and all that sort of thing. Um, um, and uh, and you can make them smaller as well. Um, some people make giant ones. Um, a trend that has come up uh, in recent years is to kind of make like maybe three different sizes and then assemble it like a croquembouche, like in a, you know, what people call a Christmas tree. Um, and so we want to fill this into the bag. So you see, I fold over the edge and you hold it over your hand, you, you're, it's shaped like the, I always say it's shaped like the letter C, okay? And so your finger or your thumb become the, the edge to clean your spatula off. And so scoop it up, put it in the bag, and you see I'm just drawing it across my, my thumb there so that I can get the excess off. That way I don't have it all in the bag and not on the outside. And again, don't fill it too full. Fill it as well as you can handle and because you also don't want it all squishing out when you now fold this up to gather it up and start piping. So you want to gather it up so that you get the air out. And so this is why I wear an apron and then twist it off. And just so you want to hold 
the piping bag in the palm of your hand like you're holding a ball. Right? And you're, so I'm right-handed, so that is where I hold the bag for squeezing and control. Your left hand is just guiding it. Um, and so the little circles by squeezing, stop squeezing, and then in a circle pull away. And make these little mounts. You see, I'm holding the bag just slightly above the pan. Squeezing, stop squeezing, and in a circle, flick it away. And after they're all piped out, we're going to tap the tray on the table and then they have to dry for about 30 minutes before you bake them. If you miss the drying step, you won't get the nice leveled up foot. Um, that is, it'll, it'll leak out the bottom if you don't let them dry. Um, so you need to let them dry nicely and then they will rise up nice and straight. And so now we want to tap the tray by sort of dropping it onto the counter two or three times. This gets rid of any big bubbles that might be trapped and kind of levels off the tips a little bit. And so now they'll all be kind of sticky and you let them dry for half an hour. You let them dry for half an hour. Um, once they have dried for half an hour, you can see they're quite smooth and you can actually touch them and they feel sort of dry to the touch. Right? And now they'll, they're ready to go in the oven. And they take about 15 minutes at 325. So I usually check them after 10 because um, you can always leave them a little longer, but when they're black, they're done. Right? Um, and so we'll pop these in the oven and uh, we'll um, start to prepare a, um, a filling. So I'm going to make a little bit of um, chocolate ganache um, that I can use for filling them afterwards. We won't get to the filling today, but I can at least show you making of the ganache. Um, also in that, uh, this one is a bit of a, a cheat or a trick because uh, we have, with all the uh, isolation and minimizing um, unnecessary trips to the grocery store, uh, we don't have any heavy cream right now. Um, so I'm going to make ganache simply with um, chocolate, milk, and butter. Um, and so uh, I'm using a dark chocolate. Um, it is a 70% uh, cacao. And so uh, what that essentially means is 30% uh, of the chocolate is sugar and the other the, the other 70% is cacao mass um, and um, may contain, usually quite common, it also has lecithin. Yes, soy lecithin as an emulsifier. Right? Um, and this says may contain milk and so on, so it's probably made in a plant where they also make milk chocolate on the same line. Um, so basic ganache, um, traditional standard heavy ganache is two parts chocolate one part cream uh, by weight. So for every 200 grams of cream, uh, 200 grams of chocolate, 100 grams of cream. Uh, a medium ganache is roughly equal portions. And uh, then a soft or liquid ganache is uh, two parts cream and one part chocolate. I like to go somewhere for this, for this uh, filling in a, in a macaroon, is I like to go somewhere between a heavy and a medium. The medium is almost too soft and don't want it to, to leak out. Um, and the heavy is just a little bit too stiff and too rich. Right? Um, and so going back to also the the, uh, the chocolate, the cacao, there's um, in retail, you will pretty much only get one type. But for professional bakers, they will select different chocolates, um, partly based on the cacao mass, but also then based on the amount of cocoa butter in the cocoa mass. 
um, chocolate that is used for um, coating, for like making the, out, the coating the outside of chocolates and things needs to have a little less viscosity, it needs to be thinner when it's melted so that it coats nice and thin. And so for that, the amount of cocoa butter is usually in the high 30s, uh, about 36 to 40% almost. Usually 38 is the most common. Right? Um, and then for uh, certain fillings that might be a little bit lower, like for mousses and things like that, um, it, it might be down to like 32%, something like that. Um, and then for ganache, because uh, you can use a little more cream that way, and it makes it a, a more cost effective and still get lots of chocolate flavor is that it might be only 28 to 30 percent uh, cocoa butter um, so those are differences but again those are not available at all retail those are available through the larger uh, manufacturers like Barry Calibo um, and uh, they, they sell them in different uh, grades so to speak um, they don't actually call them grades they just call them types they based on uh, like the number the amount of uh, uh, cocoa butter that is in there. Um, so we're going to make um, uh, some ganache based on uh, 200 grams um, of chocolate. And now usually I would use 150 uh, grams of cream. So meaning it's not one to one, it's not 200, it's not two to one, not 100, it's right in between 150 grams. And um, 150 grams of heavy cream um, is 35 to 40 percent butter fat. Um, in a kitchen where there's a lot of um, culinary cooking sauces and things like that, they'll usually use a 40 percent butter fat cream. Um, this just means less reducing time on the stove for them. Um, in pastry baking, we usually use a 35 percent cream. In Germany, um, uh, parts of northern France, and so on the cream is usually only 28% um, for whipping. And then you'd have in France, it would be common to buy a separate cream for um, chocolate ganache and things like that, or you add butter. Right? Um, and so that's what we're going to do today is we're going to add butter um, because we have a, um, a basically like a skim milk, like it's only a 1% milk, uh, meaning that there's only 1% butter fat in it. Um, so I, I need, you know, roughly 35 to 40% fat out of that 150 grams of cream that I was going to add. Um, so if I take 40 to 45 grams of butter um, and 110 grams of milk, then I have my uh, the same composition of the heavy cream. The difference being it's not emulsified and, and um, uh, hasn't been um, pasteurized, hydrogenated together. So you don't want to boil the butter with the cream because you won't get it to solidify as nicely. So you, I mean, with the milk. So you boil the milk. We're going to heat the milk on the stove and to melt the chocolate. And then we're going to add the cream, the butter in at the end. So I'm going to get those things measured here. Um, and uh, then we can um, start to get that made up. I need to heat up the milk good and hot. And this is one of those instances where I like the convenience of a microwave. Um, just want to make sure you have a large enough container so it doesn't boil over. Uh, that is one of my specialties, is allowing cream to boil over in the microwave. Um, so I'm cutting the butter up into small pieces already too to make it easier to blend in. If you have a an emulsion blender, um, that is a great way to finish it off and get it all fully emulsified. If you want to add liquor flavor, um, which I will be adding some Kahlua to this, but you add that after all of the uh, hot everything, the hot cream and, uh, and or butter is emulsified in first. Otherwise, the adding the alcohol to the hot milk or cream could cause it to curdle and split. One thing I want to do with the chocolate first though is um, cut it up a bit smaller. So that it melts easier. And you can also pre-melt the chocolate on 
a double boiler. Now adding the hot cream or hot milk that is. And there's the oven calling. You can see the milk it starts to get the uh, chocolate melting right away. I'm going to tilt that without it. Maybe I can tilt the camera down there. And so I'm going to let that stand just for a moment before I mix it in and mix in the butter. This is the first set of the macaron and you can see they um, nicely they lift it up a little bit and they release well they're a little bit warm still to pull off the paper but they're nice and firm these had 15 minutes and once they cool they release very easily and i don't know if we can see through the can't see through the the silicone mat that well but the oh there one came off so you can see there's just a little bit of color to it um, let me get that in the camera. There we go. And just a tiny bit of color. That's that's all we're looking for. Right? So that they'll be nice and soft and chewy on the inside and crisp on the outside. <clears throat> so I did these for 10 minutes, turned them around and gave them another five minutes at 325. One set I'm going to bake yet in a little while is also what I piped ahead is I made some little miniature macaron. Um, and I use these for decoration on pastries and things like that. So I have in mind to make a, a dessert kind of with a, a, a chocolate cake with a raspberry jam layer and some chocolate ganache. And then just have these decorated on, on top. Now some people take to their ganache with a whisk, um, which is not a good idea because it, it can cause the, the fat to lump up and curdle, but you also don't want to splash it like that. And so we, using a, a rubber spatula is, is best to kind of nicely stir it in. And we want to stir in the milk, the liquid part here, until we get all of the chocolate pieces melted. Um, most commonly, we would rewarm it over a double boiler uh, but I'm just going to make use of the microwave and just put it in the microwave for 10 seconds to warm it up some more and keep doing that until I have all the chocolate melted. And yes, I did just put a stainless steel bowl in the microwave. Um, it often seems to shock and surprise people uh, but it's quite simply stainless steel. What makes it stainless is that is the nickel that is added to it. And nickel will not arc in the microwave. Um, so the reason you can't use metal like aluminum foil or anything that is just plain steel or iron um, in the microwave is that it will arc. It will make a connection and you'll see sparks flying and and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it'll usually destroy the microwave. Um, so as long as the bowl does not make contact with the door or any of the walls in the microwave, stainless steel microwaves just fine and will not arc. And so it's almost all melted. I'm just going to give it another 10 seconds. Now all of the chocolate is melted. And, and I'm going to add in the butter to get that nicely blended in and emulsified. So my chocolate is warm enough to soften the butter and melt it in without turning it into oil. So this way, um, I also retain what in the uh, fat scientists will call the crystal habit, um, so that it helps the, the butter, the dairy butter fat crystals 
um, cohabitate with the cocoa butter fat crystals and give you nice crystallization and that way it'll be uh, this is important because then when you when you consume it the way it melts on your tongue is nice and smooth um, if you completely melt the butter and blend it in um, it will not recrystallize in the same manner and will form very large fat crystals and then this will be perceived uh, as being rough or not smooth on, on the palate when you eat it. And so this is my, my ganache filling and once that cools and sets up a little bit, I can use it to fill the macaron. Um, you can also beat it with a paddle or a spatula a little bit to slightly aerate it. Um, and so it gives an even nicer melt uh, in between. And once I have all the butter worked in, the last thing is I'm going to add just a little bit of Kahlua uh, for flavor. And you'll see as the butter gets all melted in and it's, it, it gets nice and shiny. Um, trying to capture the light properly there. It gets nice and shiny. Shiny and smooth. So I will add and so I want about a tablespoon of Kahlua. Is again, it's not to. We're not trying to make a mixed drink. We're we're trying to flavor it to give it a nice flavor, and so that coffee flavor from the Kahlua marries really well with the chocolate. Um, another version of this I do. I don't have an espresso machine right now, um, but is another version I like to do is where I replace some of the liquid with uh, espresso coffee. Um, to make it like a chocolate espresso ganache with Kahlua and it's just really nice um, uh, you know especially if you're not I, I like pastries but I don't like things very sweet um, so if there's one been one um, hallmark of my desserts over the years that the most common comment I get is that it's not so sweet but in a in a positive sense in a complimentary way and so there it's all nicely emulsified and it's a nice beautiful smooth ganache and that will uh, set up as it cools and become pipeable so that it doesn't leak out of the macaron and the maracaron of course have to cool completely before we can fill them and it's it's best usually to let them cool to the next day if you can so like other cookies it's a good idea to remove them from the pan once they're cool enough to be removed. You see they come off the silicone nicely. They're, they have the nice um, slightly browned bottom um, and this nice foot where it, it lifts off. See that? And that's from allowing them to dry. If you don't allow them to dry, this will leak out. Um, and be rather unsightly. They're even just delicious just like this. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to fill them necessarily, um, but that is typically what we usually do is we fill them. I didn't finish piping yet, so you can, pipe, you can see it still pipes out nicely.
So yeah, so here's the rest of the batter piped out. And so once again, going to let these dry for 30 minutes and then bake them off. And that's as easy as making macaron. Um, they're, they're nice little pastry. They are uh, relatively easy to make. Uh, the hardest part is the folding. Um, if you fold it too much, then they will collapse and uh, they flow too much. Um, if you under mix it, uh, you will have too much air captured and then they will pop up and be hollow inside. Um, so that's where uh, this term that is, I hear a French pastry chefs always use as the making the macaronage. It has to be just the right flow. I saw one video once where um, what the lady suggested for homemakers, like uh, also for when making sponge batters and things, is that when you uh, lift the spatula up with the batter and the way it flows, if you can draw a figure eight without it breaking and that it holds its shape, that that's about the right texture. So that's that's a good guideline. But basically, if it, it flows off the spatula a little bit, but doesn't spread in the bowl, that's where you want it. But if it's just coming off in clumps, it's probably not mixed enough yet. Okay. Um, well, we'll have to try this again sometime. 